Welcome everyone, thanks for joining to this uh, new Datadoc on episode, this time talking about um, data engineering pipelines, uh, Spark at scale. So Datadoc on, for those who, who don't know, it's a series of live events online that we host here at Datadoc, where we invite engineers or designers or product owners uh, working to building Datadog every day to come to us and, and share a piece of technology, a process that they're sharing, basically to share their knowledge on how they're building um, Datadog itself. Good. So this is about building Datadog, but what is Datadog? Uh, Datadog is a monitoring and security platform that helps companies improve observability and security of the infra and applications. Um, I'm sure many of you already either users or know about Datadog. But just in case this is the product that we are building, this is the product we are trying to explain on this series, how we build. Uh, my name is Sara Pulido. I'm one of the co-organizers and co-hosts of this series. So if you have any feedback, any questions, or do you want to suggest any topic that we want to cover, um, please reach out. I'm always happy happy to, to learn um, what what are your interests? Uh, but the important people today are Anton and Alodi. Anton, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Anton. I've been at Datadog for more than five years now. <clears throat> I started in New York um, as a data engineer, uh, where I've been writing um, Spark jobs for um, our time series data processing. But then very quickly, I changed uh, both the location and the position. So I moved to Paris, where I, I am at this very moment, uh, and I joined the Data Engineering Infrastructure Organization, which is responsible for um, building and maintaining tooling for data engineers um, across the company. Um, so in the past five years, I've worked uh, all across the stack, uh, mainly on supporting our uh, Apache Spark and Apache Flink infrastructure for data engineers uh, at Datadog. Thank you. Um, Alodi? Hi everyone, so I'm Elodie. I joined Datadog a year and a half ago in the Paris office, and I work as part of the historical metrics team, which is responsible for all metrics that have been sent to Datadog more than 24 hours ago. So with my team, we ingest hundreds of terabytes of data every day, and we heavily use Spark to process this data. Um, recently, for example, I worked on a project to find out which metrics have been used recently by our customers, and we had to process, and we still have to process, millions of metrics every day. And that's why we use Spark to do this. Fantastic. Um, yes, thanks Thanks for touching on, on the scale. I think this is very important. And, and this is something that we usually cover on every of these episodes. We talk a little bit about the scale that we run off because sometimes some of the decisions, not all of them, but some of the decisions um, are due to the scale that we're running. So, Datadog has more than two, two, 22,000 customers, and this is a monitoring company. So we gather telemetry data from our customers. And if you add up all the hosts that are sending telemetry to us, that adds up to millions of hosts. And that translates on trillions of data points per day that we need to ingest and process. And all of this also, uh, we run it on, on multi-cloud, uh, which is another thing that we will be covering uh, during during the episode. So how do we ingest and process all that data? Um, so in part, uh, we do it thanks to, to Apache Spark. And um, Alori is going to give us a little bit of introduction of what Apache Spark is and how and why it's useful for our use case. Uh, so everybody can be on the on the same baseline to, to follow on the rest the rest of the of the talk. Um, Alori, uh, go ahead. So um, Apache Park is a distributed data processing engine that works on clusters of machines, whether on-premise or in the cloud. It has been developed to reduce, to replace Hadoop MapReduce. Hadoop MapReduce has a few shortcomings. It is complex and requires verbose and a lot of boilerplate setup code. It is also slow because it has to write intermediate results to disk. And Hadoop MapReduce only supports batch processing. On the contrary, Spark has much more, uh, offers much more um, computations or other way to like perform queries. And that's why Spark is very useful. So as I told you in, 
when I introduce myself, I use Spark a lot with my team. Um, I'm part of the historical metrics team, which is responsible for ingesting, storing, and creating all metrics sent to Datadog more than 24 hours ago. So for example, when we look at the time series over the last week, all data older than 24 hours have been produced by my team. And to make metric queries faster, we don't load points at the second level, but we pre-aggregate data over space and time so that we don't have to load too many points. And to do this, we use Spark, and we have to process hundreds of terabytes of data every day. We started using Spark at Datadog in 2015 to replace Apache Pig. With Apache Pig, we were processing gigabytes of data every day, and now we're able to process terabytes of data every day. Um, we run our Spark jobs on Kubernetes, I mean, almost all of them. And this is something Anton will tell you about in a few minutes. With Spark, we only do batch processing. And for our streaming use cases, we have chosen to work with Flink. Um, and we are happy to discuss with you in the Q&A Q why we have chosen to work with Flink and not Spark streaming, but the main reason is was that Flink was a better fit for a use case. Now that I've said that Spark is powerful, let's see the key characteristics of Spark. To start with, Spark has a very high speed. It takes advantage of multi-threading and parallel processing thanks to multiple executors in parallel and, and multiple drive um, cores on each executors. Um, with Spark, you also retain intermediate results in memory, which means that you don't have to spill to disk and you have a very limited disk IO. And this makes Spark, uh, Spark much faster than Hadoop MapReduce that writes all intermediate results to disk. However, you have to be careful about this, even though you can write intermediate results in memory, if you want to write too much data into memory, then you will have to spill, then you will spill to disk and your Spark application will be slow. Another characteristic of Spark is that Spark is easy to use. It provides, um, it constructs all data structures on resilient distributed data sets, also called RDDs. And Spark provides a set of transformation and actions to operate on these RDDs. It's very easy to join two RDDs, perform a filter, a map, or a reduce operation, just thanks to the transformations that are provided by the Spark API. Spark is also very modular, and this is something that is uh, much better than Hadoop MapReduce. It provides high-level APIs for main programming languages, such as Java, Python, Scala, or R. And it also has libraries for diverse workloads that can run together in the same Spark application. For example, you can process structured data, train machine learning algorithms, process graph, or stream data, all this thanks to the different libraries of Spark that are Spark SQL, MLlib, GraphX, or structured streaming. And to finish, the last key feature of Spark is that it is extensible. It can read from and write to a wide range of sources. And this is possible thanks to all the connectors that are provided by Spark. You can connect to Apache Cassandra, to MongoDB, Apache Kafka, or the different cloud storages. All this to say you can integrate Spark in almost all of your jobs because you can connect it to all the sources that you can have. Well, all this being said, Spark looks very powerful, but you may wonder how does it work? How is this possible? So let's have a look at Spark architecture. As I told you, Spark is a distributed data processing engine and has all its component that works collaboratively on a cluster of machines. Spark has three main components, a driver program, a cluster manager, and a set of executors. First, the driver manager orchestrates parallel operations on the Spark cluster. It requests resources, whether CPU or memory, from the cluster manager for executors. And it communicates directly with the executors and the cluster manager. The cluster manager manages and allocates resources for executors. Spark provides a built-in cluster manager, but you can also use Apache Hadoop Yarn, Apache Mesos, or Kubernetes. For example, at Datadog, we used to work with Apache Hadoop Yarn, 
but we are about to finish our migration to Kubernetes. And to finish the set of executors, executors execute tasks on the workers, and they have multiple cores so that they can perform multiple operations in parallel. And they communicate a lot with the driver. Another important feature of Spark architecture is that data is partitioned and distributed across the physical cluster. Each executor is assigned its own data partition to work on, and they are the partitions that are close to them. This is called data locality. Partitioning allows for efficient parallelism, and data, data locality minimizes network bandwidth. So this makes Spark much more powerful than other a processing engine. However, because data is partitioned, you sometimes need to shuffle your data. This means that you that you need to exchange data across executors because some operation may need to shuffle all data. For example, a shuffle can be triggered by a group by or by a joint operation. And when you shuffle data, you have to load all data into memory and then shuffle it, then write it back to executors. However, this operation is very costly because you don't take advantage of Spark parallelism. And we can see that CPU time scales exponentially with shuffle size. And you may also have some memory issues because you have to load all your data into memory. So you may spill to disk. Uh, you can also have out of memory errors. So shuffle operations are very tricky. And this is an issue we'll look at in a few minutes at the end of like later during this talk. And we'll also propose some optimizations for shuffle operations. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alodi, for that great intro to, to Apache Spark. Um, and yes, yeah, shuffle is something that definitely we are going to be covering because it's a, it's a great deal um, for, for us. And, and we are going to give some of the tips that we learned over the years on how to mitigate this, this particular issue. And, and as we explained, we are going to cover this for two, from two angles, uh, teams who use uh, Spark to run jobs, uh, but also teams that maintain the data engineering platform to help other teams be more productive with Apache Spark. And Tong is part of that team, and he's going to give us an introduction of what they mean by this data engineering platform and how it's helpful for all the teams at Datadog. So Anton, uh, take sure. It yeah, so as I mentioned before, I am part of the data engineering infrastructure organization, uh, which maintains an internal platform for data engineers in the company. And our main mission is to ensure that uh, data engineers like uh, like Aludi <laughs> focus on their Spark uh, pipeline business logic. And uh, our organization takes care of everything else. And it means uh, Spark cluster management, um, Spark job scheduling and orchestration, um, Spark job configuration, uh, cloud permission, CI CD, local tooling, uh, metadata uh, management, uh, notebooks, uh, etc. Um, when it comes to the platform itself, um, we currently support uh, tens of thousands of Spark jobs per day, which process hundreds of terabytes of data in uh, multiple cloud environments at, in, um, at once. So, for example, on the screenshot, you can see an example page uh, from the platform. So I think it's an overview page for a uh, for Spark job that ran in sometime in February. Um, so you can see the platform UI contains a lot of useful information for data engineers, um, such as uh, links to Datadog dashboards, Datadog logs, Spark history servers, or any, everything they need to debug the jobs. Uh, you can see the information about the cluster. You have the uh, links to GitHub for the code um, that ran. Uh, for the job. Um, also, you can see it on the screenshot, but you can also inspect the Spark parameters, which we used for the job. Um, and just to make it clear, uh, you can see that, you know, the UI looks kind of similar to the main data application, but just to make it clear, uh, it's an internal um, internal platform only for data engineers, but we are actually reusing the same UI components um, as the main data application. That's why it might look familiar. Um, so I think now we can focus a bit um, on the back end of our platform. Um, so here's you know, a very simplified diagram of the platform's architecture. Um, and our main idea here is to provide easy abstractions for Spark job management. Um, so whether the users um, interact with the back end via the UI, which I just showed, or a Python CLI, 
So whether they run the Spark code from Jupyter Notebooks um, or whether they you know, schedule their Spark jobs using uh, Luigi, which is a Python uh, scheduling orchestration framework. I can also you know, talk about it more uh, in more detail if people are interested. Uh, but in the end, all Spark jobs and um, uh, Spark clusters are all managed by our backend, which is a collection of Python and Java microservices running in Kubernetes. Um, now, I guess we can zoom in on how the backend actually um, does this. So, um, as I mentioned before, we run Spark jobs in multiple clouds at the same time, and we focus on providing um, convenient abstractions for the users. So here is a very simplified view of what the pl platform looked like until very recently, so until our <laughs> migration to Kubernetes. Um, so for every um, user API call, for example, you know, create Spark cluster, we had three implementation of the same logic uh, in our backend. So depending on the cloud provider, uh, we would transform the user's API call into the appropriate cloud provider managed service API call. So in Azure, we used um, HD Insight, which is a managed uh, you know, Spark Hadoop offering. In GCP, we use Dataproc. In AWS, we used EMR. Um, you know, as you can imagine, <laughs> this uh, entailed um, high maintenance cost because each one of these services has very different features, like for example, auto-scaling. Um, uh, these services have different versions of Spark, different versions of Hadoop with different release cycles. Uh, all of them have their own different quirks, limitations we have to work around. Um, also, the services are constantly evolving and we have to keep up with, uh, with the updates. And whatever feature we add, generally we would have to code it three times. So provide like three implementations for, for each cloud. Um, and all in all, this made it very hard for us to provide a consistent user experience um, in all environments. And on top of that, there was also an issue with cost. So when you run a Spark job using a service like this, um, you're not only paying for the uh, virtual machines, which run um, the actual Spark job, but you also pay an additional price, um, a markup cost for the service itself. And you know, just these arguments alone could have been enough to convince us to to migrate to to Kubernetes, but there was also you know a general push at Datadog to to migrate everyone to Kubernetes anyway, since it's our standardized way of deploying application. And right now, basically all of Datadog uh, runs on Kubernetes at this point. And this is how we started our Kubernetes migration. Um, so you know, as you can see uh, now, the <laughs> um, the diagram became much simpler. Um, so thanks to Spark and Kubernetes, we can easier provide uniform environments. We no longer have to implement um, you know, features uh, three times. And it's only one kind of Spark and Kubernetes uh, backend for our, for our jobs. Uh, it's much easier for us to provide a uniform um, user experience. So the same features, um, the same Spark versions, the same Kubernetes versions. So it's much, uh, much easier for us. And on top of that, we're only paying the um, uh, uh, for, for the VMs, we don't pay the markup cost anymore. Um, and I guess now we can go a bit deeper and look into how we actually run Spark on, on, on Kubernetes. Um, we first started with um, Apache Livy. So Apache Livy is an open source uh, REST API for Spark. And this made our initial migration easier since we also used the Livy on EMR, Dataproc, et cetera, to submit the Spark jobs. So uh, th this uh, facilitated the... The migration, however, we had to uh, fork Levy uh, because the project is inactive right now to make some changes. Um, and it's also missing some features that we needed, uh, like authentication and so on. So moreover, when we were using Levy, um, our backend was still quite complex because it was our backend which managed the state um, of each Spark job. So whether the job is running, whether it's failed, which parameter is used, et cetera. So all of this has uh, convinced us to migrate to um, a different technology. So now we are using the uh, Kubernetes operator uh, for Spark, which was open sourced by Google. So different projects, it's uh, more feature rich. Um, and it also helped simplify our uh, backend. So now we mostly delegate um, Spark job state management to the Kubernetes operator 
and our backend acts more as an interface between the users um, and the operator. However, there are still things that are being done by our backend. So for example, uh, load balancing. Um, when it comes to load balancing, I guess the first important thing to understand is that what we want to achieve is to have the Spark driver and all um, Spark executors uh, run in the same cloud provider availability zone. Um, and the main ideas behind that is to minimize network latency. Um, although maybe in the EWS, it might not be always true. I can, I can also talk about this uh, a bit more. And um, also in, in most cases, cross AZ network traffic is more costly. Um, and we need to somehow enforce this, um, uh, enforce this constraint that the Spark driver and executors are in the same AZ. So in our case, we simply use uh, one Kubernetes cluster per availability zone. And in our largest environments, we have dedicated Kubernetes clusters just for Spark jobs. Uh, and in small environments, we share Kubernetes clusters with other uh, Datadog applications, and uh, you know it works without any any problem. And the uh, the actual load balancing in the backend right now is a very simple round robin algorithm with some you know Kubernetes cluster health checks, and it works relatively well right now. However. Uh, we're already starting work on smarter load balancing, which would take into account things like um, Kubernetes cluster capacity, subnet IP usage, uh, you know, things like that. Great, uh, thanks. I, th I think it's it's uh, it's it's a great thing to see how scaling an engineering organization usually means creating this internal platform, these these extra abstraction layers to to help other teams become more effective on what they actually do and um but not only that uh so we will be talking later on some of the optimizations that anton's team has been building on top of this platform that has also improved um how those jobs are being run um so we are going to talk about a lot about optimis optimizing a spark um first we are going to cover specific Spark optimizations, not related directly to the platform, but uh, mostly related to, to the jobs. Um, so Alodi uh, is going to, to cover this part. And obviously we are going to start with the shuffle operations that, that we've covered before that are super costly and at the scale that we run on uh, becomes really a bottleneck. So Alodi, um, can you cover how your team is trying to make this um, a little bit better. Yes. So as we said at the beginning of this talk, the shuffle size shuffle time scales exponentially with the shuffle size. And we also hit memory issues with shuffle operations. So shuffle is something really tricky to work on. And the first thing we look at within my team are the shuffle partitions. The number of shuffle partitions is very important because the more shuffle partitions you have, the more shuffle blocks you will have, in this case, quadratically. And this means that you will have also more network requests. Um, once again, the number of network requests scales quadratically with the number of partitions. So you will want to have fewer partitions so that you have fewer network requests and your Spark application will be faster. To set the number of partitions, you can use the default Spark parameters to do this. There's the Spark default parallelism parameter for RDDs and the Spark SQL shuffle partitions for data sets. But you can also fine tune the setting for each individual data set. We'll see this in a minute. As I said, we want to have fewer partitions and this is great because the smaller your shuffle blocks are, the worse your compression is. So um, once again, the fewer partitions you have, the bigger, the larger your partitions will be, and the better will be your compression. However, you have to be careful about this because if you want to load too much data into memory, this is what we said before, then you may have memory issues. So as a general rule of thumb that we try to follow at Datadog, we try to have partitions that are about the hundreds of megabytes so that it fits into memory but it is not too small as well. So working on your number of partitions is really important. You need to have a good number of partitions that you have fewer network requests and a better compression rate, but also you should avoid to have tasks that are too large 
or that require too much memory. As I said before, you can fine tune the number of partitions for each individual data set. And this is something that you can do with this dot repartition um, method. And you can define the number of partitions that you want. You can use a hard coded value, but this is not something I would advise you to do. I would rather advise you to find the, the optimal number of partitions from statistic of your data sets. And once again, to have partitions that are hundreds of megabytes big. Another way to um, reduce your number of partitions is to use coreless. Coreless reduces the number of partitions by merging partition files together. So by comparison with the repartition operation that we just saw before, um, coreless doesn't shuffle any data as it merges partition files while repartition should for partition files. So it requires more memory. You can use callless if you have large partitions and you want to perform an aggregation operation on these partitions. Let's say that the gray box, the big gray box on the left of this slide is one big partition and you want to apply an aggregation on this partition. Then I would advise you to split it into small partitions. Apply your aggregation so that you take advantage of spark parallelism. And then you can call this all small partitions that have been aggregated into one or two or like fewer partitions. And then you can perform any shuffle operations that you want after this call is. Um, to use call is, you just have to um, use the call is method provided by Spark. In the small code example that you have here, you can see that this, this is another like use case for colors. You can see that we have a co-group operation followed by a flat map. And the combination of these two operations increases a lot the number of partitions in our data sets by about two or three times. So here we use colors to have much fewer partitions so that our combined by key operation doesn't have to process too many small partitions. So Colis is great because you will have fewer shuffle partitions and because it doesn't shuffle data to reduce your number of partitions. However, and this is the same issue as before, you will have larger tasks and you will have more memory needs. So you have to be very careful about this. And something that you really need to keep in mind with Colis is that you can only decrease the number of partitions and you can't have more partitions. So if you want to have more partition, you should use repartition, not callless. Another optimization I want to discuss with you for the shuffle stage is map site combine. So map site combine allows you to perform aggregation on the map side, which means in each executor before shuffling data. And this helps reduce network traffic during the reduce operation. So on the example here, you can see that in each partition, we have the nth prod element that is repeated three times in each partition. So then the combined by key operation has to group together these nine uh, nth prod elements. But if you use combined by uh, map site combined, sorry, we first pre-aggregate data on the map side and we dedupe all nth prod elements in each partition so that we only have it once in each partition. And then we can apply the combined by key operation. And you can see that now we only process the nth prod elements only three times versus nine before. So map site combine is like a good way to reduce your disk usage because the amount of intermediate data that needs to be written to disk is reduced. It also reduces your network traffic as the amount of data that needs to be shuffled is reduced. Um, and all this like makes your shuffle operation faster because you have fewer data to shuffle. However, you have to be um, like kind of careful about using map site combine because it is not always useful. And it can, in some cases, increase your memory usage because it has to um, store intermediate results on executor nodes and can also increase your CPU usage because aggregating data on the map side requires additional CPU resources and this can impact the performance of other tasks running on executor nodes. 
And um, as you can see on this code example, using map site combine is very easy. You just have to flip the map site combine parameter in the combine by key operation. Cool. Um, so thanks, thanks for sharing those tips on how to to improve uh, shuffle. Uh, so you've shared three three methods, uh, Alodi. How how would you recommend uh, people to choose one one or the other? Well, I think that the most important is that you know how many partitions you have, how big they are, and which data do you have in each partition. If you have too many partitions, then you need to have fewer partitions. Um, and I would advise you to use colorless and not repartition, for example, because you won't have to shuffle your partition files. However, if you don't have enough partitions, you can't use colorless. So I would advise you to use repartition or group by to um, repartition your data set so that you have more partitions. Now, once that you have once you have a good number of partitions, if you know that you have a lot of duplicated data in your partitions, I would really advise you to use map site combined to reduce the volume of data that needs to be shuffled. However, if you don't have any duplicated data in your partitions, using map site combine is useless and even harmful because you will require your memory and CPU that won't be necessary. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, I, I see people, some people posting questions before we move on uh, on the chat window. Please move them to the Q&A button if, if you um, please, so we can, we don't lose track uh, of those when we, because we are going to, to look only to the Q&A. Uh, good. Uh, the, the next thing that we are going to be talking about uh, is the tungsten format. Alodie, what is tungsten format? So the tungsten format is an internal row-based format from Spark to lay out data set and data frames in the off heap memory. Spark uses an efficient mechanism called encoders to serialize and deserialize between JVM and its internal tank set formats. In JVMs, we only manipulate pointers to off heap memory. By opposition with the tank set format, Java objects have very large overheads because they need to store header info, hash code, unicode, etc. As you can see on this slide, a Java object is much larger to store than just a tungsten object. So using the tungsten format instead of creating Java object is really like good to reduce your memory footprint and also to have less serialization. On the example here, um, you have uh, we compared the tungsten format and the Java objects. So in the first part of this example. In the map function, we manipulate a scalar object. And x is a scalar object that got deserialized from the tungsten format with the memory and CPU overhead that comes with it. In the second part of the example, we no longer manipulate scalar objects, but a row object that is a pointer to the tungsten object in the off heap memory. And we access data in the tungsten format thanks to the query execution.rdd operation. And we um, ran these two uh, pieces of code and we had some very interesting results is that when we used the text in format, it was uh, more than twice faster than when we used Java object. And when we enable off heap in our job, it was even more faster. Well, this the off heap um, memory, as I told you, is where we store the text and format. But you may wonder what happens if off heap is disabled for your job. And this is what happens for um, one of our tests. That's not a problem. The text and format can be stored on heap, but it is better if it's stored off heap as Spark is optimized for this. Um, another usage of the text and format is for all transformations that you can apply on your data sets. All transformations have two versions. One of them is the ideas of transformations, the domain specific language transformations. And the other version are lambda transformations. And um, lambda transformation use serialized objects, while DSL operations uh, transformations use the text and formats. And something that you can see on the example here is that it is very important um, on the press example, sorry. 
Um, it is very important not to mix DSL and lambda transformations because you will have to deserialize and serialize data, data all the time. And this is really bad for the performance of your Spark application. But if you have to choose only one kind of transformations, I would just advise you to use tungsten transformations because they are much more powerful. If we look at the following example, this is a filter transformation. And the first one is a lambda filter, while the other one is a DSL filter, also called SQL filter. And once again, you can see that the DSL operation is about twice faster than the lambda transformation. So as you can see, text format is very powerful and it really improves the performance of your sprite job. And as you can also see, using the text format is very easy. It doesn't add any complexity to your code and it's very easy to implement. You don't have to tune hundreds of Spark parameters. It is very straightforward and this is something I would really advise you to implement in your code. Good. Uh, thanks. Thanks for sharing those tips. Uh, but uh, not only uh, we've learned how to optimize uh, those, those Spark jobs, uh, Anton's team has done a bunch of optimizations at the platform level uh, that um, also help uh, running these this, uh, Spark jobs. Uh, some of them uh, are going to be around the, the migration to Kubernetes, uh, but uh, one of them in particular is not, and, and I found it very, very interesting uh, because sometimes the the small optimizations uh, if run at scale like uh, that everybody on the, on on Datadog can benefit from really make a huge difference and that's very was very interesting when I learned about uh, this parameter standardization what is what is this Anton uh, sure so as I already mentioned before uh, we've been writing Spark jobs for a number of years now so starting in 2015 with Spark one. And as we scaled the number of Spark jobs and you know the number of data engineers working with Spark over the years, uh, there's something that we noticed, and its users tended to copy paste the hundreds of Spark parameters <laughs> that I already mentioned for their new jobs, um, and they would copy them from older jobs, and then they wouldn't really take enough care when it came to uh, optimizations. And in most cases, what this meant is that people would copy parameters from some really big job uh, for their new uh, smaller job. And this resulted in over-provisioning, uh, wasted resources, and well, no, consequently higher cost. Uh, so definitely not great, especially as we scale. Um, since this problem became more and more noticeable, uh, we proposed a solution on the you know, platform level, which is to provide what we call um, standardized t-shirt sized um, Spark parameter presets. Um, and what this um, means in practice is that the, the idea is that data engineers can now simply choose a preset set of parameters. Um, so, you know, the number of executors, the, um, the memory size, et cetera, based on their um, rough expectation of the jobs input uh, data set. So, you know, S, M, or L, uh, input data set size, and then they just focus on their business logic afterwards. Uh, and if they notice an issue, they would tune it. Um, they would tune the parameters later. And in practice, for approximately um, eighty percent of our use cases, those t-shirt size parameters work uh, pretty well and require just little tweaks, you know, here and there. Um, but then the twenty percent of use cases, which are more specialized. Um, they would require custom, like really customized spar settings, um, and most often it's be, it's due to a scale, so uh, a lot of uh, a lot of terabytes. <laughs> um, but and the migration to t-shirt size parameters was quite successful generally. Um, for the jobs that we migrated, we saw uh, maybe 10, 20 percent cost reduction, um, and it also makes new job creation easier as well. Um, and something else we invested. Uh, that's related to this is out of the box in-depth uh, performance monitoring for Spark jobs, because this is something that you know helps users realize that their job is poorly optimized, uh, and also help them gauge whether this t-shirt sizing is working or not. Um, I guess this subject would also require another separate one-hour talk, so I'm not gonna go into <laughs> into detail here. 
uh, but happy to share more. <laughs> yeah, it's may maybe for a, for a future future episode for sure. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about now um, Kubernetes. Uh, I guess uh, your team has been working on this migration for for a year now. So a lot. I'm guessing a lot of learnings, a lot of um, new things that you had to to take into account. So let's let's start by by talking about Kubernetes pod allocation. So what, what happened here? Yeah, so I guess we're staying on the topic of, uh, of Spark settings. Um, and something we noticed during our migration from Yarn to Kubernetes is that we couldn't always keep the exact same Spark settings for our jobs when we're migrating them. And this was especially true for jobs that used uh, dynamic allocation. And here on this graph, you can see an example job uh, that we're on Kubernetes using the same settings as uh, on Yarn. And the job itself just processes, um, I think approximately six terabytes of data and it runs for 30 minutes. Um, so on this graph, you can see the number of um, executors that the job used. And it started with just one. Um, it's controlled by this initial executor setting. And then it scales up uh, the number of executors relatively aggressively. So it ends up running uh, with 177 executors at peak and 115 executors on average. Um, and the scale up uh, is controlled by those scheduler uh, backlog timeouts uh, value, which basically define um, how fast Spark will create new executors when they're pending tasks in the backlog. And note that Spark will add new executors exponentially. So if their tasks to stay in the backlog uh, for some time, uh, Spark will add uh, executors pretty fast if the backlog timeouts value is so low. Um, and in this example, the timeouts are actually on the lower side, we can say. Um, and that's, you know, this Spark parameter has worked relatively well on EMR, but they were clearly suboptimal for Kubernetes. Um, and also another thing we saw with these parameters is that there was a lot of CPU that was wasted. So here you can see another graph of uh, CPU usage for this job and approximately 50% of the CPU is wasted here. Um, so the idea is that the job scales very quickly, over allocates executors, um, and also finishes uh, quickly. Uh, and you know, if wall clock runtime was the only thing we were optimizing for, this would be fine, but we also want to be mindful of cost and resources. Um, so here we're wasting CPU, so we're wasting resources. Um, so we would no. We looked into tuning some parameters here, um, and in order to um, solve this issue, we did two things. Um, so the first thing is that we increased the number of initial executors to eighty, so which is a bit uh, below the average number of executed from the previous run, and we also increased the backlog timeouts so that Spark scales. Um, slightly less less aggressively. And what happened with the job is that the, the same job ran with 125 executors at peak now. So it's 30% less than the, the previous run. Uh, and it used 87 executors uh, on average. And when we look at the CPU usage graph, we can see that at the same time, um, the CPU usage improved too. So here on this graph, uh, only 30% of CPU is idle compared to um, fifty percent before, and the wall clock run time stayed the same. So we're still at thirty minutes for the du job duration, which is which is great. And by the way, you can see um, a slight drop uh, of CPU usage towards the end of the run, and it was the same thing in the in a previous run. And it's actually a kind of more of a code uh, specific issue that the team that owns the job is is uh, is aware of. And so they, once they improve this. Um, this uh, kind of uh, this problem, it should also make uh, the CPU usage uh, even better. And by the way, the team is also working on um, automatically setting initial executor um, setting based on the input data volume. And it's something that we want to provide uh, more generally as part of um, you know smarter um, T-shirt sized uh, settings for our users. Nice. I, I love seeing that also. Like uh, some of the optimizations that the, the, the teams are doing, uh, you learn also about those and, and bring them as part of these general platform improvements. That's that's great to see. Okay, so uh, quickly, the last thing we are going to be talking about before we go to Q&A 
Um, so it's Kubernetes shadow lane. And this is something that we also had to make some changes as, as we were learning. Um, so Anton, can you, can you cover this thing? Um, sure. So I think before we talk about scheduling, I can do a very quick uh, introduction to what the Kubernetes scheduler is. So Kubernetes scheduler, it's part of the uh, Kubernetes control plane, and its main responsibility is to assign uh, pods to nodes. So uh, pod, just to make it clear, it's the minimal deployable unit of computation in Kubernetes. And the scheduler basically you know, very roughly, it looks at the nodes that are in the cluster, uh, the resources, their the, the state of the nodes, etc. It looks at the at the pods are you know in the queue waiting to be assigned, and then tries to match the, the the pods to the nodes. And once there is a match, it schedules the 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 pod on the node. And when it comes to Spark, um, with the um, default Kubernetes scheduler. And you know vanilla Spark, we have the following scenario. Uh, first of all, it is the driver pod that is scheduled, and then the driver pods made, makes a Kubernetes API request to create executor pods. Um, so you know, actually, this diagram looks um, kind of reminds us of the um, Spark architecture di diagram that um, Aludi uh, sh uh, showed in um, in the beginning. So here you see the driver, um, the executors, and Kubernetes acting as the as the cluster manager in the middle. Um, so you know, here in 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 this scenario, um, we can have a problem with resource deadlock or resource starvation, because if we have too many Spark drivers created at once, um, we they would all request um, you know executors to Kubernetes. And we run out of um, out of cluster resources, and so no job can, you know, schedule their their executors fully, and so no job can make progress, and we're in a sort of deadlock. And in order to reduce the risk of this happening, we added the Apache Unicorn scheduler to our stack. Um, Apache Unicorn it's also an open source project, and it's basically you know a more feature rich scheduler for, for Kubernetes. Uh, it already has built-in support for uh, for Spark, for running Spark on Kubernetes. And the idea is that it changes the way Spark applications are scheduled. Instead of scheduling just uh, the driver and then the executors, Unicorn will first ensure that there are enough resources for, uh, for, for the whole application. And only then it will allow the app um, to, be, to be scheduled. And this is known as gang scheduling. And in Unicorn concepts, um, the application is scheduled as a as a task group. Um, one limitation of this is it doesn't play very well for job with jobs that use um, dynamic allocations, but the impact can be minimized if we properly set the the initial executor settings. Uh, so this kind of um, reinforces the, the the previous example where we up the number of initial executors from one to, to 80. And another nice feature of Unicorn that we also use is a priority queues. So it allows us to prioritize certain Spark jobs uh, over others. So for example, in case of incident response, when we have some urgent uh, backfill, for example, that we need to do, we can set a very high priority for, for this backfill job or set it to like a high priority queue, basically, and, then, and let it run first. Good. Um... Thanks. Thanks for explaining very quickly the problem with the default scheduler and a Spark, which I, I guess uh, people thinking about running a Spark in Kubernetes will um, will suffer from this. Um, so it's great to 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 share this. Um, okay, so we are ready for to take some questions. But before, thank you um, for for um, joining us. If you think uh, working on these problems on either side. Uh, it's interesting. Please go to our careers page uh, and and have a look to our openings there, um, and we can start getting some some questions. Um, let's let's take the the first one for, that came from the audience. Um, how do you deal? And I guess this one is is for LOD, How do you deal with timestamp issues in your pre aggregations? Well, we don't have like we don't really have time like issues with timestamps because we have buckets of data with um timestamps that are rounded to to different um 
Like, so for example, we run data to the hour level. So we have uh, time buckets of data for each hour and the appropriate timestamp for this hour. And we pre we apply all aggregation that, that is needed for each timestamp. Um, well, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that's clear. But like we duplicate our data, so we have um, for each hour the max of our data, we have the mean of our data, etc. So we don't really have timestamp issues because all timestamps are branded when we pre-aggregate data. Good, um, thank you. Uh, the next question, um, maybe for, for Anton, uh, how do you monitor the data pipelines, both the infra and the apps that are running as part of the pipeline? Yeah, and I believe there's actually another question that was similar, which says, how did you implement Spark Performance Job Monitoring? Uh, we're uh, working around Sparklands. Do I have some recommendation here? Um, and actually, the answer might surprise you, but we use Datadog <laughs> for monitoring our Spark pipelines. So when it comes to the infra side of things, um, it's, you know, metrics, logs, uh, APM, um, RAM as well. Uh, so real user monitoring for the, for the UI. Um, nothing too, you know, too exotic. We, for example, we use the, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, our, our Python and Java for, for the, for the, for the backend. So, you know, just, uh, Java APM, uh, Python APM, uh, uh, metrics we we use a mongo database for storing the the state of the spark jobs so we have we use the datadog mongo um integration um yeah i believe this is it for the infra side of things so, uh, i mean we also use the um you know the cloud provider um the cloud provider integrations as well at datadog and then for the data pipelines themselves uh, it's also datadog um, so there, there, there are multiple things. The first thing is the Spark uh, integration for metrics. So we use that. Um, we use logs a lot. We use the Datadog profiler as well. So it used to be opt-in uh, for the users, but I believe now we set it by default for uh, for everyone. So every time you run a Spark jobs, you you get the the profiles for for the job, and then we are also working on some, um, you know, more in depth um kind of Spark performance uh, monitoring with, um, let's say kind of hooks in the um, in the Spark job code directly so it's not an external integration that runs in the datadoc agent but it's something that's you know inside the the spark job code and it sends a lot of kind of additional metrics that you can't get from the from the api um so we also have this for monitoring um Good. Yeah, and I think there was another question about the monitoring the data quality. Yes, I was uh, I was actually yeah. going to follow up with oh, that yeah, one. Sure. So um, what about data quality? So I guess with all that amount of data and being ingested and processed, how, how do you ensure the, the quality of the data is, is good? Yeah, I think I can answer this question. Um, so for the data quality, we have some integration tests or end-to-end -end tests that test all our data pipelines. So we submit points to Datadog the same way our customers submit points. And then we'd see what happens to our points, how they are processed in all our data pipelines. And after all the processing, we just check that our points have the value we expect and we have as many points as expected. And we do this for all our customers. We submit points on the behalf of our customers and we check that we don't have any issues for all our customers. So. If there's an issue, we are aware of this, and this means that we're working on it. Good. Uh, and and also, on, I can add on the infra side, uh, as I mentioned, we provide a metadata um, metadata service. So, and you know, data quality is definitely something that can that that should be part of uh, you know general metadata uh, 
um, service. And we're also adding, uh, like working on adding, you know, this uh, kind of automated data quality checks that would be then uh, propagated to the to our metadata service. Uh, I, I don't work on this exact, uh, you know, team of products, so <laughs> can't go into into more detail, but I can I can ask around if people are interested. Good. Um, thanks. Um, so, uh, what about this one? Are they uh, because I think it's a very interesting one. Are there any downfalls that you can think already of using tax stamp format? Um, well, I think I'm not sure there are any downfalls. The tax stamp format has been introduced in like a second like stage of Spark. So you first had lambda transformation. They they added a text and transformation as part of the text and project. So they're just an optimization of Spark. So I, I, in my opinion, uh, there isn't any uh, downfalls of using the text and format. Good. So it's it's just a uh, better, better Spark. Um, OK, I, one about Kubernetes, which I think is, is interesting. When running a Spark on Kubernetes, uh, this attendee, they have 1,000 pods running in parallel. And they are also using data for monitoring. So how can they monitor the pod size and how much of it's being utilized, utilized by the application? Um, well, I think the example that I shared um, in the pod allocation um, you know, topic, I, it looks like what you would want. I just use metrics for 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 this example. So I mean, in data log you have the Kubernetes uh, integration that sends all the metrics for you know uh, for for uh, regarding the pod uh, requests um, limits uh, and also the actual usage. So memory usage, CPU usage. And then the graph that I showed, it's literally plotting, um, you know, those two uh, together. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, metrics, uh, metrics, metrics, be metrics is yeah. the way to go. And I think on those on those slides, uh, the the actual uh, name of the metric was was shown as part of the graph, I believe. Um, so yeah, once you see the recording, uh, this is being recorded, so you will be able to to pause and and see what what metric Anton was was uh, using on that on that case. Good. Uh, so we are at time. Uh, so we, we are going to, to need to leave it there. Uh, but thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thanks for the questions. Very insightful. Uh, thanks, of course, Antang and Alodi for sharing their, their knowledge. And um, I'll see you on the next one, I guess. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.